Today, we get to hear a message from Jesus to the church in Philadelphia. Now, we've talked about churches like Thyatira and Sardis and Pergamum. Those churches sound strange to our ears. But Philadelphia, we're right at home with that name. It's the name of the most important city in the founding of America. And even today, that same city, Philadelphia, is the sixth largest city in the country. We're used to hearing Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia means brotherly love. Now, some may think of the current city of Philadelphia and think, I don't know how much brotherly love is going on there. But the great thing is, uh, we have a, I have a friend who's a pastor in Philadelphia. We were there about a year ago, uh, maybe yeah, a year ago, year and a half ago. And to see what God is doing in that city is a reminder that in Philadelphia, there are people who are loving others and loving God. And that's a great encouragement. But thinking about the American city of Philadelphia, I spent some time reading a book by a man named Gary Nash this week called First City. It's about the founding of Philadelphia, and it was really fascinating. Philadelphia was founded, laid out, named, and founded by a man named William Penn. William Penn was a strong Christian Englishman. And the king of England granted to William Penn the rights to the entire area that we now know of as Pennsylvania. But William Penn, very remarkably, chose not to take the land from Native Americans, but instead purchased it from them. He wrote this, the king of the country where I live has given to me a great province therein, the land of Pennsylvania. But I desire to enjoy it with your love and consent that we may always live together as neighbors and friends. He wrote that to the Lenape chiefs whose land it was. And instead of taking the land by force, William Penn paid a very generous price for the land out of his own personal finances. So at great personal expense to himself. The Lenape chiefs signed a treaty with William Penn for the founding of the city of Philadelphia. There's a very famous painting that is meant to recall that meeting. William Penn said to those chiefs as well, the great God has made us not to devour and destroy one another, but to live soberly and kindly together in the world. I have great love and regard towards you and listen to this. And I desire to win and gain your love and friendship by a kind, just, and peaceable life. The author of this book, Gary Nash, who this is written, uh, the book was I think just four, five, six years ago. He wrote this about the founding of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Pennsylvania never entirely lived up to its visionary founding principles. Obviously, nobody is perfect. But nowhere else in the hemisphere where Europeans were colonizing did there exist such substantial toleration for religious and ethnic differences and such relatively peaceful relations with Native American groups. Most European visitors were astounded at what had been achieved in the city of Philadelphia. It's an aptly named city, the noblest city in America's founding is named after the church in Revelation that receives the highest commendation from Jesus. And this morning we have the opportunity having thought through the city of brotherly love, to think about the church in the city of brotherly love and to think about how there may be Philadelphian, Philadelphians living among us here today at Calvary Church, meaning 
People who have embraced the way of love, kindness, gentleness. To those of you this morning, Jesus has a word of encouragement. The message to the church in Philadelphia is one of two messages in the book of Revelation that has nothing negative in it at all. It is simply pure commendation. And for those of you here who need a word of encouragement, my prayer is that you will hear Jesus speaking to your hearts today, encouraging you, commending you, and urging you to keep going in a life of love for God and love for others. So if you will, would you take a Bible and turn to the book of Revelation chapter three. Revelation chapter three. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. If you're using one of the church Bibles, it's page 993. We get to hear our sixth of seven messages from Jesus directly to us as a church. This one begins in verse seven of Revelation three. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? And Jesus begins this message the way he begins the rest of the messages with an introduction of himself. And when Jesus introduces himself, the things that he picks out to say about himself help us to understand the message that he wants us to hear today. Jesus says two things about himself in this introduction in verse seven. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. The first thing Jesus says about himself is he calls himself holy and true. This is Old Testament language and it's a reference to in the Old Testament, God is called holy, holy, holy. When Jesus comes and says that he is holy and true, he is saying that he is the faithful representative of that holy God. The God in the Old Testament who has all power, all wisdom, and especially all love. Jesus has come in the fullness of deity to represent that God who is all powerful and all knowing and all merciful and all compassionate and all kind, that God who is love. And Jesus says, I am that God. I am the faithful representation of that God who's come among you. He also says that he holds the key of David. He's not mentioned that in any of the rest of the letters when he's introduced himself. And to understand what he's getting at for the rest of the message, think with me about the story of King David. That's who he's talking about here. King David is Jesus' great ancestor. His story is told in the Bible. He was the second king of the nation of Israel. The first king, Saul, looked like a king. He was tall and regal and mighty in his demeanor, but God was not pleased with him. And so God says, I need a king after my own heart. So he sends the prophet Samuel to a man named Jesse's house to go find the next king. David, who is one of Jesse's sons, was the least likely candidate to be king so much so that his dad doesn't even invite him to the party when the prophet is coming to pick the next king. David, who is the youngest, is left tending sheep. Jesse brings in his oldest, his second oldest, all his boys, and they stand before Samuel. And Samuel thinks, well, surely it's the oldest. He looks like a king. God says, no. Maybe it's the second oldest. No, 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 no. Until finally Samuel says to Jesse, you got to have some more kids. It's a no to all of these. And Jesse says, well, there's one more, but it can't possibly be him. So we left him out tending the sheep. Samuel says, well, if that's the only other child you got, bring him in. 
David comes in and God says, he may not look like a king in outward appearance. I mean, he's just a kid. But that is a man after my own heart. In 1 Samuel 17, the very next story, this same young boy, maybe a teenager, shows up. His brothers are off at war because the, the Israel is battling the Philistines. And the Philistines have marshaled probably the greatest warrior in the Middle East at that time, a giant named Goliath. And nobody in Israel is willing to fight Goliath. David shows up not as part of the army. He's bringing food for his brothers. And he says, hey, isn't anybody going to fight that guy? And his brothers tell him, be quiet. Again, on the battlefield, he's the least likely person to be in this fight. He's not even a soldier. He's got no armor. He's too young to qualify. But what the story makes very clear is the strongest thing on that battlefield is not that nine foot giant. It's David's heart. And David is a man after God's own heart in his love for God and his love for others. Jesus comes holding the keys to the kingdom that God promised to David. David was not perfect, but God said, I will establish your kingdom and after you there will be a descendant who will reign forever and ever. And Jesus shows up holding keys to a kingdom that did not come to pass by strength or outward appearance or beauty, but came to be because of love, love for God and love for neighbor. And Jesus says, I hold the keys to the kingdom of God. What I shut, no one can open. And what I open, no one can shut. All authority and power is Jesus because what David did, Jesus did infinitely better. William Penn, we talked about him earlier. He got his peace-loving principles from Jesus. This is what he said on another occasion. I deplore two principles in religion. Obedience upon authority without content, consent, that is forcing people to try to believe something, and destroying them that differ with me for Christ's sake. William Penn looked at Jesus' life and saw that Jesus had the strength and the power to crush his enemies, but he didn't. In the Garden of Gethsemane, all these troops show up to arrest him, and Jesus says, I could call down legions of angels right now. He has the authority in and of himself to simply say the word and annihilate them all, but he doesn't. When he's put on trial with Caiaphas and false people, or people come forward with false accusations, Jesus can refute them easily. They don't even make sense in comparison to each other. He doesn't say anything. When he's before Pilate, he could debate Pilate into the corner, but he doesn't say anything. This is where William Penn got the idea. It's not through strength, but through love. It's not through force, but through love. And that Jesus demonstrated love for the Father and love for his enemies. You and me. And by doing that, he inherited the kingdom that will never end. And Jesus holds the keys to that kingdom. This is the Jesus that has a word of encouragement to those of us here today who choose the way of love. He begins his commendation in verse eight. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Let's start with the you have little strength comment. One of the most noteworthy things about this American city of Philadelphia in its founding is that when people came to visit the city, they looked around and wondered, where are the military forts? Where are the fortresses? Where are all the armies? And the truth of the matter was, is all the rest of the colonies had to have all of these forts and all of these armies because whatever you take by force, you're gonna have to keep by force. But William Penn didn't do that. 
He lived in peaceable relations with the Native Americans around them. And like you heard in that quote, listen, most modern historians tend to be somewhat cynical. But even a cynical modern historian looking back says there was no place like it in the hemisphere. People showed up and thought, how are you doing this? By outward appearance, Philadelphia looked like the weakest of the American cities. Where are the forts? Where are the armies? Where's the display of power? This is what the church in Philadelphia looked like. They, along with the church in Smyrna, were the two smallest, least influential, poorest churches of the seven in the book of Revelation. Jesus says, I know you have little strength. I know to outward appearance, you don't look like much. And what he says about the city of Philadelphia in America and the church of Philadelphia in Revelation, I think he's saying to many of us here this morning, I know your deeds. I know how you act. I know that at school you could be the kind of person who's always fighting to be most popular, but you're not. You could be the kind of student who's trying to undercut others so that in case things are graded on a curve, you'll get a better score than they do and get into a better college. But you're not doing that. You could go on social media and bully people or anonymously tear people down. He's like, but you're not doing that. I know your deeds. I see what you're doing at work. You're not using an aggressive personality to try to climb the corporate ladder. You're not beating down people who don't do things exactly the way you want it done. In your family, he's like, I see you're not the loudest. You're not the one always arguing. You don't always have to get your way. Jesus says, I see that about you. The world thinks you don't have any strength. The world thinks you're the weak one. He says, but I know better. You look to outward appearances Like you're not the smartest or you're not the most aggressive or you're not the most charismatic or you're not the loudest, but he says, what I see in you is a heart of compassion and gentleness and kindness. After all, nobody looked at Jesus when he was on earth in his first advent and thought he looked strong. Isaiah makes it very clear. There was nothing about Jesus that anybody would have been drawn to. He was not the most athletic. He was not the straight-A student in school. He was not the most powerful or the most charismatic. What he was the most of was loving. And Jesus is looking around this sanctuary today, for those of you at home as well. And he says, I see you. I see this in you. I see that you have embraced the way of love. And he says, well done. He says, thank you. The world keeps pushing you. Be more assertive. Be more aggressive. Be more antagonistic. Be stronger. Show your might. And Jesus says, but I see your heart. And I love it. Be encouraged today. I think Jesus also wants to encourage you. Not only does he see what you're doing, he wants to remind you of five rewards that are coming for you. The first, verse eight, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I'm going to give you one guess as to which colony in the founding of America was most successful in leading Native Americans to faith in Jesus. Any guesses? (laughs) It's no surprise that a colony that is founded on Christian love for God And for others that chooses not to use force to take land from Native Americans, but instead offers peace and love and kindness, it's no surprise that the Quakers in Pennsylvania were the most successful group in leading Native Americans to faith. One of our elders last week shared a story in the elders meeting. He talked about how he was pulling up to a house to go uh, do a job at that house. And uh, like most of us, he noticed there were political signs in the yard. 
And in this case, he noticed that all those political signs meant that this person was most likely on the opposite side of the political spectrum from where he was. And as he got ready to go, you know, the, kind of the feeling of, Ugh. as he got ready to go into the house, Jesus reminded him, just love them. Just love these people. And so he walked in not to debate with anybody about politics and not even just to do the job, but to look for a particular way. How can I love this family? How can I love these people? And he used politics not to change anybody's minds about politics, but as a quick bridge to talk about Jesus. And Jesus opened the door for that to happen. And you might think, these two people from opposite ends of the political spectrum, how in the world could they have a conversation? Jesus says, when I open a door, nobody can shut it. Amen. Now think with me. If God is love, which he is, and if God loves the whole world, which he does, who do you think he is more likely to send to share his son with other people? Those who embrace the way of love. And so to those of you here today who perhaps all week heard, you're not smart enough, you're not strong enough, you're not aggressive enough, you're not charismatic enough, you're not whatever enough, Jesus is saying to you today, but I see your heart and your compassion and your humility and your gentleness. I will open ministry opportunities for you that I will not give to anyone else. And no one will shut that door. The second reward or encouragement. Verse 9, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. The second reward that Jesus promises is vindication. We sometimes shy away from that word because it kind of sounds, well, maybe I shouldn't want that. No, Jesus says, what I promise for you is all those people who've been telling you you're a fool, for all those people who've been trying to turn you into who they are, Jesus says, I'm going to bring them to you and I'm going to make them acknowledge that the way of love is the right way. The irony of this, remember, this is supposedly the weakest church. It's their enemies who come on their knees before the week. It's not the strong church. It's not the rich church. It's not the influential church. It's those who choose the way of love because Jesus says, I will fight for you and I will bring them before you. And even though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they will see your good deeds and the love that comes from your heart. And they will glorify your father in heaven. The third thing Jesus promises as a reward for you today, choosing the way of love. Verse 10, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. The third reward that Jesus promises to you today, protection. Protection in the midst of trial. We are going through a pandemic that I call a plague from God. In the midst of this plague, I just have to be honest with you. It's really hard to be in church leadership. It's hard to make decisions about, well, when are we going to meet? How's that going to work? Are we going to do baptisms? Do we do communion? Do we have high school ministry? Do we have children's ministry? What about this week? What if these schools close down? What if we do this? What if this happens? What if the governor says that? What if the CDC says that? Trying to figure out what in the world to do in the midst of this is hard. But I will tell you, and you don't have to believe me, but God is my witness, that we have tried to make all of these decisions out of love. Love for God and love for you. That God wants us to keep meeting together, so we're trying to find a way to do that. That God commanded us to do baptism, so we're trying to find a way to do that. But out of love and out of kindness, I felt the Lord say, well, I already gave you COVID-19. Why don't you do these first baptisms? That felt like a kindness. Okay, we're trying to do that out of love. Trying to make decisions together, we're trying to do it out of love for God and love for others. And I believe God sees that. 
And so in the midst of this, look, I got COVID-19. The Lord gave it to me. In the midst of it, I thought, I have to be honest with you. It's pretty hard to call up people and tell them I might have infected them. Because then they got to quarantine and shut down. But brotherly love demands that we do that. And in the midst of it, we have tried faithfully. We're not perfect, but we've tried faithfully each time to choose, well, what is the loving thing to do? What loves God and what loves others? And I'm going to tell you, as a result, we have felt the protection of God through this plague. It doesn't mean that bad things haven't happened. I just shared with you, we had a person in our senior adults ministry pass away from COVID-19. We had to shut down for two weeks in August. We may have to shut down again. I don't mean that God's protection means that nothing bad happened. I just mean that while all the stuff is going on and in the craziness and in the chaos and in the uncertainty and the fear, we have felt God with us each step of the way. That doesn't mean we did everything right. We just means that he was there with us. And in our weakness, we felt his strength. Okay, Lord, well, these are the rules. We'll try. This is what you seem to be giving us. Lord, they don't like this. That group doesn't like this. The Lord says, look, just do what I ask you to do out of love for me and love for them. And in the midst of a situation which, honestly, you cannot please everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. We have felt the Lord's favor and protection with us. And what Jesus is saying is, you'll experience God's protection now when you choose the way of love. But also you will receive assurance that you will not go through the really bad plagues that are coming in the rest of the book of Revelation. Now, let me be very clear what I'm saying because the nuance is fine. I am not saying that if you as a Christian don't choose the way of love, that you will go through the rest of the plagues. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that if you as a Christian choose the way of love, what you will receive is assurance that you won't go through those. Meaning some people are basing their assurance on how the end times are going to work on theology. The problem is our theology of the end times, especially of the end times, might be wrong. Jesus says, when you choose the way of love, you will see how I protect you now in the midst of what's going on. And that will give you assurance then when the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world, that's not COVID-19. When the hour of trial comes on the whole world, that you and I are going to be just fine. So the third reward is assurance. Assurance of God's protection. The fourth, verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The fourth reward is the strength to protect what God's entrusted to you. Do you hear the irony of this? Everything about this church is supposed to be weak, yet they're the strongest church around. Jesus says, what I give to you, no one will be able to take out of your hands. Hold on to it. The only way you could lose the rewards that you have for choosing the way of love is if you choose to give them up if you choose to stop walking in the way of love. And so Jesus is saying to you, be encouraged. You are walking the way of love and you are earning for yourself rewards in heaven and no one will be able to take them from your hands. The fifth and final reward. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Your fifth reward is you get to be a named pillar in God's eternal house. Now this idea of naming pillars, it actually comes to us from the earthly temple that Solomon built. This is David's son Solomon. We mentioned David earlier. 
1 Kings 7 verse 21 talks about when Solomon builds the temple in Israel. It says that he, Solomon, erected the pillars at the portico of the temple. The pillar to the south he named Jachin, and the one to the north he named Boaz. Meaning when you walked into Solomon's temple, when you went to Jerusalem, and you walked into Solomon's temple, you walked past two named pillars, Jachin and Boaz. Now, what is, what, why do they get called these things? Well, they're references. Jachin means that that pillar is named after Solomon's dad, David. Jachin is the Hebrew word for established. And it's a reference to 2 Samuel 7 where God promises to establish David's house forever and ever. And here is Solomon who has been placed on David's throne because of David's love. And so Solomon says, I'm naming that pillar after my dad. And so every time Solomon or anybody else walked into the temple, they walked past a pillar named for David with his heart of love. Well, what about the other pillar? Well, the other pillar is named Boaz. That's named after Solomon's great-great-grandfather. You might be familiar with the story. It's a story of a man named Boaz and Ruth. It's in the biblical book of Ruth in the Old Testament. During the time of the judges when nobody seemed to be obeying the Lord, everybody was going their own way, there was a guy named Boaz. He wasn't a significant guy in the country. He lived in the city of Bethlehem and he was a good man. And out of a heart of love and kindness and gentleness, he took it upon himself to care for two widows, one Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth, who had both lost their husbands. And Boaz does what you're supposed to do when you have a heart of love. He cares for these women. He gives Ruth a job. He gives her some extra stuff when she's working to make sure she's taken care of. He sends benevolence home to make sure Naomi is taken care of. He even steps up and marries Ruth because he can redeem her from the life in which she's in. Did you hear a little of that testimony in Anna's story? During baptism today, that sort of idea. That Boaz-like father figure who comes in and does something out of kindness and love. So Boaz does that. And in God's kindness to Boaz and Ruth, he gives them a baby. That baby's name is Obed. Obed grows up. He has children of his own and one of his children's named Jesse. Jesse grows up, gets married, has children of his own. One of those children is named David. David gets married, has children of his own, and one of them is Solomon. And Solomon knows this temple and David wouldn't be here without Boaz. Without this act of kindness and gentleness and love that nobody in Israel paid any attention to when it happened, but God did. And from that love and that kindness came David and then Solomon and then ultimately Jesus. You see, today in this society, we name things after rich donors. You can walk around college campuses, you can walk all over the place, you see buildings named for rich donors. We name things for successful people, people who accomplish great events. We build monuments to sports figures, or we talk about, we give them a Hollywood star of fame because they did such great work. Or you know what? You can just buy a brick and put your name on it at some football stadium somewhere. Well, that's because that's what this world values. We value money. We value power. We value athletic success. We value beauty. That's the things we value. In God's economy, that stuff has no value. And so when you walk into God's house, you will find pillars not named for rich donors or not named for people who were stars in Hollywood, you will find pillars named for people who loved. And the reward that God promises to you this morning, I see your deeds. I know that you've chosen the way of love. I know that everybody around you thinks you're crazy. I know that your family's trying to talk you into being more aggressive, more assertive. I know that your neighbors are trying to convince you to be 
more of a resume person. Do this, have more money, buy bigger cars, do all of this kind of stuff. Jesus says, but I see you. You've chosen the same road that I walked down. And he says, you will be a pillar. You will be a pillar in my eternal house. And when people walk in, they're going to see you and your name written there in a house that will last forever and ever. Lots of people spend a lot of time trying to get enough money to get a building named after them here on this planet and that building's gonna crumble in 20 years. Jesus says, but I see you. And you look like you don't have much strength. You're not the person on social media doing all this stuff. You're not the person fighting for homecoming king or homecoming queen or whatever that. You're not the person at work who's stabbing people in the back. You're just quietly and kindly being a mom, being a friend, walking alongside of people in trouble, taking care of the homeless, sitting with those in need. And Jesus says, let them have their buildings. I'm going to name the pillars in my house after you. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast from Calvary Church. We hope this message has brought the light and hope of God's presence into your life, refreshing your soul for the journey the Lord has you on. If you have a spiritual need or would like to connect further with the work God is doing through Calvary Church, seek us out online at calvarygr.org. On our website, you can also find an archive of previous messages from this series. Thanks for listening.